Okay, so um, I just want this to come up and then I'll share the link with the Slack group as well. Just in case somebody cannot find it. Let me just go to Slack. Okay, let me find my Wheel of Fortune. Let's shuffle. So I think let's give the people a few minutes to, uh, to join the YouTube channel. I just want to have a squiz on a separate device here to see if there are people joining the YouTube channel. Subscriptions. Oh, Philip is joining us. Hi, Philip. How are you doing, Philip? Hey, hello. Good, thanks, and you? Ah, not too bad. Actually, remarkably hot today. Yeah, same, yeah. We went from winter to summer in three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Philip. Hey, good, how are you? Good, I'm here. I'm just going to say my piece at the end. Okay. Oh, Frank, a friend has asked me to help him with the project on the Pi. He wants to do a thing for his boat. Perfect match. So there's a, um, he's got a set of instruments, and then there's some of the, um, um, some packages he wants to, to use to do some of the work. But then basically, it'll run a local um, server that I will then have something that talks to and basically give him a, a bird's eye view of everything that he can easily switch mm. uh, between views and stuff. Looks like a perfect use case for a Java VIX application. Yes. With, so, with uh, tiles of VIX of Gerrit Grunewald to visualize some stats and graphs. And, and mm. I have, I think I have a screen of that in my presentation. You know, I did something years ago for a, um, a geophysicist who was doing, mm -hmm. um, so we, um, when they do uh, geophysical surveys, one of them that they do is uh, they, they, uh, they basically walk with a magnometer um, uh, a route and then um, they have a magnometer in a stationary position, mm -hmm. and then they walk the map. And he decided this is taking too long. He wants to fly it. So he uh, got a microlight, and they demagnetized it. 
and then I mounted the magnometer and the radar altimeter at the bottom. And then he would prepare the map and he would upload it into the device. Mm -hmm. And um, it would then basically tell him how far is he from the route. So you can basically just follow the screen and you can see the, um, uh, the height and you can then fly, fly the route. And, um, and while he's flying, it would give him uh, um, a sample of the data. And we did some statistical analysis so that um, if it's just generating noise, um, because it sometimes happens with the magnometers, then you can um, uh, abort the flight and go back because he's wasting time. And um, so you could then do a, a, a survey faster than anybody else. Indeed. And then, and then he goes back and he, because the post-processing software was hugely expensive. You didn't actually buy it, you rented it. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, but it, you could now before the, end, before the time see that whether the, it's valid data or not, because he had cases where the magnometer would now function and then while he's booking and then he is paid for the post-processing rental and then he finds out it's noise. So um, um, that saved him a lot of time and money. Indeed. And he did surveys all over. And But I imagine nowadays they just use drones instead of um, uh, trying to fly the, yeah. uh, the route. I'm, there's a Belgian company doing some startup doing uh, land measurements with, with drones instead of mm. actually walking around. Oh, yes. And I mean, the GPS, we, get, we can get GPS that's so accurate. Um, you can do pretty good stuff if you yeah, indeed. know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got a few people on the on the stream. Uh, it is seven minutes past, which I think is uh, a uh, socially acceptable amount of time to wait. So um, I'm going to start and welcome our uh, audience. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to start off by doing a draw. So um, at the previous meetup, I asked people who wanted to be part of the uh, draw to join our Slack channel, and I got their names from there. So, um, and there were only three that are not members of the, the organizing committee, and obviously we're not part of the draw. We just take the license whenever we want. So, um, <laughs> no, so um, I'm going to spin it twice just so that you're sure it's not a, um, a setup of some kind. So I'm going to click and then it spins, but the first spin is not going to count. So um, uh, Daniel Gray, maybe you're lucky the next time. I'm going to close it and then I'm going to spin again. Okay, now let's see who's the winner. And... Mm. Oh! Okay, so Daniel is the winner again. Congratulations, Daniel. I will contact you. I actually don't have your email address, um, but I will send you messages via Slack and uh, a Meetup and um, organize to get the coupon to you. Congratulations. And once again, thank you to... Jet Brains for sponsoring us um, in the, such a generous way. So our speaker this evening um, hails from abroad, but it feels like he's in the room because of a miracle of modern technology. Uh, I don't know what we are going to do for um, uh, what happened. With my share, no, there is stop share. I'm trying to find buttons. Um, I don't know what we're going to do for speakers when the um, 
we start having in-person meetings again. Uh, but we'll have to make do. And um, but I'd like to welcome uh, Frank Delport, uh, all the way from uh, Belgium. And he is coming to talk to us about Java and Java X uh, FX on uh, the Raspberry Pi. And um, it's a subject that I'm very interested in. And um, I hope you may find it interesting. So um, over to Frank. Thank you. Uh, let me immediately share my screen. I have a presentation, of course, to share with you. Um, Okay, about me, uh, I'm Frank Laporte. Good evening uh, from Belgium. Uh, we are in the same time zone, uh, so that feels like I'm very close to you, although we are on the other side of the of the world. Um, I live in Belgium and I do a lot of blogging, both on, on WebTechy and on Fuji.io. Uh, if you don't know Fuji.io, Geert will also talk in this presentation later about his website. It's a website with all things related to Java, uh, and a lot of information about the framework, about the new releases, and every day there is a post with an article um, about the language, about features, about what you can do with it. Um, I've been programming uh, since I was 10 years old with this Commodore 64. If you're about the same age as me, uh, you will definitely remember this marvelous device. It was uh, yeah, one of the first computers which allowed you to do real programming without a lot of uh, high level knowledge, with the basic knowledge. And that's how it all started uh, for me. Um, today I work at Stody uh, since December last year. Um, we are building an autonomous robot, uh, at this moment a grass mower robot, um, which works without a perimeter wire. So if you compare it to traditional uh, automatic uh, robot mowers, uh, you need to put that wire around your grass. We uh, work with a, a vision system, a camera, so the robot knows where it is and it will stop if there's something uh, blocking the way. It will drive around it. <clears throat> it will alert you if there is a, a problem situation in your garden. It will even do surveillance uh, during the night. Uh, the robot itself, it's not a Java device. It's an embedded uh, Linux device, but we use a lot of Java in the backend uh, and for other applications at the company. Um, I'm also a volunteer at Coder Dojo, um, and that's actually where, where I... I got into contact with Arduino and, and Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the coaches at these events where we teach children to, to program and to cooperate and to present their work and, and, and ask others to help them and build uh, all kinds of projects with, with, uh, with the computers. Uh, but the coaches are also volunteers, so they bring their own knowledge to these, uh, to these events. Um, and that's where yeah, some coaches brought their Arduino and their uh, Raspberry Pi. So I think eight years ago, that was the first time I saw Raspberry Pi and Arduino and what you could do with it, with these very cheap components um, and how fun it is to, to use your programming skills to do something with, with electronics. Um, and I had this marvelous idea to build a, a touchscreen interface for the drum boot of my son. Um, and as a Java programmer, I wanted to use Java and I had to find out a lot how I control this, this release, um, how you can control 220 volt uh, lamps with uh, a, a small electronic device. I also had these LED strips that I wanted to control. So I uh, integrated an Arduino and uh, I needed to find a way to control this from the, from the Raspberry Pi. Um, and I even integrated a web server so that we can uh, give direct alert signal to my son that he has to come uh, to the dinner table and we don't have to shout from, from down the stairs. Now, uh, all this uh, resulted in a book, um, which is uh, available on LeanPub and on, on Elector if you want the paper version of the book. Um, and it describes everything I learned during that, that, that whole journey I had to take uh, to learn uh, what is electronics, how does it work, what is a LED, what is a much co more complex component. And all the examples that I tried out, I described in the book. So there are different components which are used, different examples, how you do a bit conversion, for instance, how you control an LCD display uh, like this. So all these are described in the book and are also part of, of a lot of the blocks I do for Fuji uh, and on my own website. So you see even uh, Spring is running on the Raspberry Pi and the Swagger interface to read the button state. 
Um, and it ends all with, with one big application which uses both Java VIX and a web server and an Arduino uh, to control uh, the LED strips. And that's actually the, the use case that, that I used also for the, the drum boot of my son. And I also got the chance to talk with a lot of Java people, uh, specialists uh, for Java VIX or for Java, the environment or, or GPI, um, the, the, the database layer. So all this uh, in the book. Um, and that's actually uh, the, the last thing I, I wanted to say about the book. I'm not going to sell something. Um, but we are here to talk about the Raspberry Pi. So what is a Raspberry Pi? It's a very small PC uh, with a low price. So you see that it's between nine centimeters and six and a half for the smallest ones. You have them in different flavors, different prices. Um, but for now, we're going to look at the Raspberry Pi 4, which is the biggest one in this picture. And you have it in three different versions, 40, 60, and 80 euros between uh, for two, four, or eight gigabytes of memory for uh, all the other parts are exactly the same. Um, so this is a very cheap computer, but it's a Linux computer. So that means that everything you're used to do uh, on a normal PC you can also do this, do this uh, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, there's a special edition of the Raspberry Pi. That's the compute module, uh, which has the same chip as the, as the Raspberry Pi 4. But the idea of the compute module is that you can use it in, in um, your own hardware projects. And you see that there are 32 different versions of this board, depending on the amount of memory, if you want Wi-Fi, uh, all these kind of uh, things that you can select from. And the prices uh, are from 25 euros to 90 euros. And the idea of this, this board is, you see it on this picture, it's a small board. You can buy an, an I.O. board um, of the shelf, which has all the connections which are available uh, on this little board. And this is your, um, uh, this is the board you use to develop something. And when you have the software ready and you know exactly what you want to build, you can develop your own base board with only the connections that you need for your use case. And there's another uh, special type of Raspberry Pi, that's the 400, which was released last year. Um, and that's actually a keyboard with um, the Raspberry Pi inside the keyboard. So all the connections are at the back and the computer is inside. No fan, uh, everything is cooled through a, a smart system of a big um, iron plate, which um, has contact with the, the heating elements. Um, the only thing you need is a mouse, a power supply and a screen, and you can get started. And you have the same connector that you, that is famous from the Raspberry Pi where you can connect uh, electronic uh, components. Now, uh, this uh, computer looks a lot like something I knew a long time ago. When I started uh, with electronics programming, when I was 14, 15 years old, I was able to connect my Lego train to this, this connector on the back and have relays uh, to control my Lego train. That's exactly the same uh, kind of stuff you can do with Raspberry Pi. You can connect electronic components like a relay, like a LED, uh, other things that you can control from software. Now, there's a big, big difference, of course. Uh, many years have passed since this Commodore 64. Um, the most important thing that I, that, that I see in this comparison is um, you can now get a Raspberry Pi kit for under 100 euros, while if you compare the price of the Commodore 64 to the, to the uh, nowadays price, it would be uh, almost 1,500 euros. So for... Um, only if you, a little money, you get a very powerful computer. Um, powerful in that sense that if you look at the monitor, that's what is the Commodore 64, that many years ago with the, the basic programming language. Um, this is a screenshot of my Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, it's attached to a 4K display, and you can even have two displays. You have two display connections. Um, and you can use uh, Visual Studio Code. You have the terminal. You have a, 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 a file explorer. I have the Arduino interface. All these programs run on the Raspberry Pi just as you would run them on any Mac or Windows PC. Um, there's a big question is why would you use Java on the Raspberry Pi? And wasn't the Raspberry Pi designed for Python? Um, and that's actually indeed the idea and where the Pi comes from. Uh, so they were working on a Python device uh, initially at Raspberry Pi Foundation. But yeah, it's it's a full Linux system. So that means that yeah, Java runs everywhere. So Java, of course, also runs on the Raspberry Pi. Um, 
another reason is yeah because you just can do it and as soon as you start combining your knowledge that you already have uh, for java software development and you combine it with electronics you enter a completely new world in my previous company i had a whole team of hardware engineers also at todi um, and they were talking about yeah i squash c and spi all the things i've never heard of because in software you don't interface with with electronic components and that's exactly what you can learn if you start doing that on the on the raspberry pi um, of course you heard it before i think java is dead I think they say it uh, ever since Java started. Uh, Java is absolutely not that. It's one of the top three programming languages um, according to the TOB index. It was for a long time the, num the number two, it's now number three. But yeah, it's you see the numbers are very close to each other between 10 and 12% for Java, Python, and C. So they are very close uh, to each other. Uh, but maybe more important for embedded systems is Java is eco-friendly, eco-friendly in that sense that um, it doesn't use a lot of energy. So if you compare it to C where they have this as the index, so uh, a similar function in C or in Java, for Java, it takes two times the energy to do the same thing. Um, if you look at, at Python, it takes 76 times uh, the amount of energy to do the same kind of functionality. Um, Java is too old is one of those other uh, arguments you hear, but actually Python is older than Java and JavaScript, yeah, the, the new kid uh, in town, is exactly the same age as Java. So there's no comparison there about the, the age of the language. And definitely now, uh, since, since 2018, when Java um, transitioned into a language which has a new version every six months. Um, we see a lot of new features, uh, improvements, bug fixes for the language uh, itself, but also for the environments where it runs on. So also for uh, embedded systems, for uh, ARM processors, uh, you see that Java is evolving and providing new features and, and improvements. Um, so last week, Java 17 was released, uh, which is the new long-term supported version. Uh, the previous one was the 11, but a lot of us are still using Java 8 a lot in production. Eh? Also, I have some, some stuff still running on Java 8, um, Java 11, but then, yeah, people kept using uh, or started using newer versions. And the long-term supported, it's, it's not that 17 is so much different than 16. It's just an evolution in the language. And for some versions, they say, now this is the version we're going to keep um, updated and security fixes for at least three years. Um, but you can just keep evolving your, your software and, and keep uh, using these newer versions. I have several, uh, several applications running on Java 16 because I can benefit from a lot of new features uh, to make cleaner code like this, the new switch uh, expressions is one of those big changes in the, in the latest versions. Um, another argument that Java is evolving is the number of contributions made by different um, companies and also uh, independent contributors to the languages. So if you see um, the, com the distribution about uh, of the contribution to this uh, GDK 17, of course, Oracle, which has the trademark of, of Java, uh, but a lot of other companies are contributing to the improvements of, of Java. Uh, Microsoft is one of the, the bigger ones in the, in the latest years, uh, but also SAP, Amazon, they are all there. Now, um, Java on the Raspberry Pi, I told you before, it is already there. So it's not that you need to do something special to get started with Java. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi. If you just go to the website of Raspberry Pi and you uh, download the imager tool, um, you will get a, a very handy application that will burn uh, an operating system of your choice to an SD card. Then you pop it in in the, in the Raspberry Pi uh, and you have everything ready to start. Now, if you take the, the desktop version with all the options, um, then you will have uh, OpenGDK 11 pre-installed. So um, Raspberry, Raspberry Pi OS is based on Debian. So Debian uh, has OpenGDK 11. 
we hope that they will, uh, of course, uh, switch to the uh, version 17 uh, as soon as possible. If you want to have a 64-bit uh, system, that's also available on the Raspberry Pi website. Um, so I said uh, uh, it's there. So um, I just installed um, an operating system on SD card. I started my Raspberry Pi for the first time. I open a terminal and I ask Java version, and I have this uh, 11 version installed. So I can immediately start with any Java application, uh, which is compatible <clears throat> or made for Java 11. Um, as an experiment, I once did uh, a compile of, of JDK on the Raspberry Pi. It's described on my blog. Um, so, oops, what's this? Um, so you can just get the sources of Java from GitHub. Um, everything to compile Java to a JDK is also described in the readme of this project. And if you run it on the Raspberry Pi, it will take a lot of CPU and it will take some time, but at the end you will have a running uh, JDK version, uh, which is an internal one. So it's based on the sources of Java and you can build um, your own JDK. It's a fun project. Uh, it gives you some insight of how JDK is developed, how it's built. Uh, but of course you have the versions available if you want. Uh, you don't need to build it yourself. Now, because we had this release of Java 17 and we have this um, virtual tool, uh, tour of uh, FuJ, um, I wrote an article on the, on the blog um, with some updates and I will give you a short overview. But if you want to read everything about it, go to, head over to FuJ.io, uh, search for Java 17 or Raspberry Pi and will definitely find this article. Um, and it has some more info about what has been released and how you can use it on the Raspberry Pi. Um, for this uh, blog post, I used um, an experimental version of Raspberry Pi OS for 64-bit uh, processor. It's not officially released, but they make a new version from time to time. So it gives you a full 64-bit uh, operating system with a lot of tools pre-installed. And you can install it with this imager tool, as I said before. So you just head over to raspberrypi.org slash software and there you will find everything to get started. Um, if you use uh, SDK man uh, on your PC already, then you definitely know this tool. It's a very handy tool to switch between Java versions on your development PC, for instance, uh, but you can also use it on the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just one uh, or, or a few lines to install it. And if you open it and you ask for uh, Java versions, you will see that you have a lot of them. And a lot of them are already available in the 17 version. So there are different providers of uh, Java JDK versions. Of course, you have, <clears throat> you have Oracle, but you also have a lot of uh, open source and commercial uh, versions available here that you can install for free. So Liberica is one of them from Bellsoft. Um, you have Oracle, you have SAP, you have uh, Timurin, which was Adopt Open EDK before, but that changed name uh, as it became an Eclipse Foundation project. You have Zulu by uh, Azul. So there are different uh, options that you have available to install Java 17 on the Raspberry Pi if you want to use it instead of the pre-installed Java 11. So with SDK, it's just SDK install Java and then the version that you want to use. So this is the Temurin version. Uh, it downloads some time, it installs it. And if you then do a Java minus version, you have this Java 17. So it's just that easy, uh, just as easy as you would do it on a, on a Windows or a Mac PC. Um, if you want to do programming on the Raspberry Pi, of course, it's not that uh, performant as a PC, that's yeah, a lot cheaper, of course. Um, but you can, for instance, use Visual Studio Code. There's no uh, IntelliJ available for Visual Studio uh, for uh, Raspberry Pi, but Visual Studio Code works perfectly. You have uh, a lot of uh, plugins you can install for Java development. Uh, as you can see in the screenshot, it shows a run and debug uh, option directly on your code, so it recognizes that this is Java code, it starts it as a Java program. So you see in the terminal, it outputs as a Java 17 version. Um, one of my big loves in the, in the Java world is JavaFX. It's um, a framework 
that allows you to build a very beautiful user interfaces uh, with Java. So as a Java developer, with the codes that you already know from your Java uh, programs that you've made, you can also make very beautiful uh, user applications. Java VIX is no longer part of OpenGDK. It has been uh, in a few uh, distributions of Oracle, but it's a different project. It's maintained in the same GitHub uh, project as, as the GDK itself, um, but the development is mainly managed by Gluon. It's a partially Belgian company, um, and they have a lot of experts in Java VIX. They maintain this, this project. They do some uh, commercial support, but it's, it's an open source and free project. Uh, out of the box, it uh, provides you with a lot of components to build uh, user interfaces, of course, unlike a color picker and, and text fields and some graphs. Uh, all this kind of stuff is, is available in the framework itself. But there is a lot of things you can find um, in the community um, as free, uh, extra dependencies you can add to your project to extend a graphical uh, user interface. For instance, if you want to create a Word-like application with this kind of menu, um, then it's FX Ribbon is just one dependency you need to add and you can configure all these uh, screens or all these tabs uh, like you need for your application. Uh, Tiles FX by Gerrit Grunwald. Um, it's one of the Java FX experts also uh, writing posts for fuji.io. Uh, um, he has this very nice library with all different tiles that you can combine some kind of dashboard-like application, for instance, um, if you want to measure the temperature in all the rooms of your house, um, if you have need a clock or a map, all this kind of stuff is available here. A lot of these tiles have animations, uh, so you can create a very uh, sexy looking um, uh, user interfaces. Um, another great library is FX Gel by Almas. Um, it's a game framework, a game engine, uh, which allows you to create very nice games with little codes. That's it's Java. So, uh, you know, from Java, you have these dependencies. They do a lot of the work for you. Uh, you only need to uh, master the, 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 the API, and then you can create all the kind of games you want to create yourself. This uh, FXGL library has a lot of examples in the library itself, and then the more complex uh, examples are in separate projects. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will show you a very small example. So Java FX, um, you have to uh, either include it in your project as a dependency or um, uh, refer to it uh, as a module. Um, and if you go to the Gluon website, you will see that they have a lot of different versions. These are only the Linux versions. And you see that they have an ARM32 version and R64 uh, version. So both of these can be used on the uh, Raspberry Pi, depending on uh, the operating system that you installed. Um, so just an example, Java VIX running on uh, Raspberry Pi. The special thing about this screenshot here is that it's rend uh, running in direct render mode. That means that um, the screen itself, the, the window manager has been uh, disabled. So you don't have a desktop interface. Um, you only see your Java FX application. So this is a perfect example or a perfect use case for, for kiosk applications where you don't want the user to interact with the computer itself. You don't want them to open a browser or restart the computer. You only want to show your application. So if you have a kiosk or a terminal uh, application that you want to create, this is something you can do with Raspberry Pi and Java FX. <clears throat> Um, also to create games, uh, we said with the FXGL library or, or with other uh, ways of doing this in Java FX. This is again a demo application created by Gerrit Grunwald. And you see that it's running uh, between 50 and 60 frames per second. So it's a space uh, invader like of game. Yeah. Now, um, we, we saw Java, we saw Java FX. Maybe you all know this before. But now what is probably the main advantage of a Raspberry Pi is the header. It's this 40 pins um, on the board where you can connect any kind of uh, electronic component. Um, I created this small uh, Java library to illustrate how uh, or what these pins are for. So we have two rows of 20 pins 
some of these pins give you a constant power like three volt three or five volt. Some of them are ground and then others uh, can be used for different use cases and all this is described here. Uh, there are some different numbering schemes also in use depending on uh, the framework or the library you're gonna use. Uh, these are all part of this uh, explica explanation in this library. So uh, what is a GPIO? What are these pins for? So they are general purpose input output pins. They are digital pins. So that means that they are either a one or a zero. Um, if you look at the Boolean value, it's true or false, but actually uh, as an electronic value, it's either three volt three or it's zero volt. It can be an input or it can be an output value, uh, depending on the thing you want to uh, do with it. Um, and if you go to a very fast communication, then you can um, do a lot of different things with it. Um, so there are different protocols that you can support with these pins like I2C, SPI, and you can control a lot of components. Uh, you have this eight by eight LED matrix, which is uh, one of the basic components used in a lot of examples. You can do serial communication and, and if you want to uh, use an analog uh, sensor, like for instance, this light measurement uh, graph is done by an Arduino. So with serial communication, Arduino board is uh, used to read the value of an analog sensor. So there are different uh, types of components you can attach and different ways to, go, to talk to them. If you want to get started with this kind of stuff, um, ask for your birthday an electronic starter kit. You have them in a lot of different prices, depending on if there's an Arduino inside the kit or not, or a Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> but most of them will have all the other components like an LCD display, a servo motor, a distance sensor. Make sure you have enough of these resistors and LEDs and a lot of wires and a breadboard, and then you can uh, start doing a lot of different experiments. If you have a little bit more money, uh, go take a look at CrowPi. Uh, the main advantage of this thing is that you cannot miswire. Pi is documented uh, on the website. I will uh, come back to later. Um, and this brings me to the Pi4j project. And the Pi4j project is a, a library um, which helps you to program these GPIOs with Java. So it's, it's object oriented. That means that it is uh, the way you're used to do Java programming, you can also do with uh, electronics. Um, and it's designed for the Raspberry Pi platform. So where does it fit in? So if you have a Java application, your Java application, whether it's Java, Java FX, I don't care. If you want to talk to these uh, GPIOs, you have this Pi4j library. Which, which is Java and uh, with GNI, it um, talks to native libraries, C libraries, which can interface with these GPIOs. So as a Java programmer, you don't have to be aware of how this communication works, what electronic stuff you have to do um, in, in your software. Um, you just have this library doing all this uh, for you. Uh, the project uh, was uh, started by Robert Savage. Uh, he's American and he did this uh, in 2012. And he thought that this project would uh, become obsolete as Oracle was working on something similar by themselves, but that didn't really happen. So uh, the project continued. And earlier this year, we released uh, two new versions of the Pi4j version one, 1 1.3 and 1 1.4. Um, one is aimed at Java 8, the other one on Java 11. But the main thing is that they added support for the Raspberry Pi 4, 400, and CM4, the compute module, which were released uh, only the year before. Um, and the problem with the support for this new board is that uh, the native libraries were no longer supported and they didn't support this new board. So we had to take a, a, a bit different path there. Um, the library supported a lot of electronic components, which was good as a developer, but was a bit difficult for um, the, the contributors to the project to be sure that new features didn't break anything and everything could be tested. So we did some uh, uh, changes there later. So um, this version one used wiring Pi, which was pre-installed on the Raspberry Pi. This is the native library to talk to these uh, GPIOs, but it got deprecated in 2019 and didn't support 
um, the newer Raspberry Pi boards. It also had a bit of confusing uh, pin number. So that's why we decided, or Robert decided, to start with version 2 of Pi 4J. So he started with this in 2019. Since then, uh, I joined, Robert von Berg joined the project, and some other volunteers joined and contributed to this new um, architecture and this new way of uh, talking to the GPIOs. And we were able to release the, the first version to release uh, end of August uh, this year. So the wiring Pi, which got deprecated, got replaced by another library, Pi GPIO. Um, and it also uses another numbering for the pins, which is uh, more known to uh, hardware developers and um, anyone, the makers who wants to use uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to look into this uh, project and how it's designed, so it, it, it the code is very well separated that it's uh, easy to uh, maintain and to understand. Uh, everything is described on pi4j.com. There's a lot of uh, this kind of charts, also a bit more complicated ones, but you see that there's a real nice structure in the code to make sure that it, everything is easy to maintain, to understand, and to extend in the future. So pi4j.com, we had a new website uh, start of this year. It has a lot of getting started examples. So we want to help you to understand how you can control these things and use these things. Um, if there's something wrong in this documentation, if there's something missing, please let me know. Uh, I focus a bit on the documentation of this project, but you can edit every page. So it's a GoHuho website, so it means a static website. All the code is on GitHub, of course, and um, all the content also. So you can even contribute there and help us to um, extend this, this documentation. And as you see, uh, there are a lot of projects using uh, Pi4j already. Um, this is just one example of a uh, real-life application using electronic components and the Raspberry Pi and then the communication between components. It's a medical cabinet, so the idea is here that uh, the green LED shows you where you have to take a medicine. Um, and if you put your hand in the wrong box, it turns red. So it's a tool to help nurses pick the right medicines. Um, it's just one of the many examples where you see that these cheap electronics can uh, provide a lot of added value. Um, let's take a look at, at one of the examples of the website. It's, it's the minimal example application. So it means it's really the starting point if you want to get started with Java, Pi4j um, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, it uses one LED. Um, it has a resistor that you don't blow up the, the LED because uh, we have three volt three coming out of the Raspberry Pi. Most LEDs only need two, uh, two volt two or something like that. And we also have a button. So we have uh, an input is the button and we have an output, which is the LED. Um, so this is really the basic use case of electronics. Um, in the code, you will see that there's a lot of documentation. Actually, there's a lot more documentation than there is code, uh, just to show you how everything works and how you have to use uh, everything. So you have to initialize Pi4j, uh, the library. It will discover which Raspberry Pi you're using and which uh, modules you have loaded, uh, and then provide you with the right uh, values. Um, adding a button as an input means we need to configure it, the button. We need to tell uh, our, uh, our system um, that we want to use an, an, an input, um, a GPIO as an input. Whoops, I did something wrong. Okay. Um, and also we add a listener. So here you see that we are actually using Java style of programming. Um, combined with electronics. So a button, it actually looks like a button in Java FX. If you have a button on your screen and someone clicks on it, you want something to happen. That's exactly the same thing we do here with this physical button. So if as soon as something uh, clicks on this button and the, the state goes to low, so it's closed, um, then we count the number of presses and we do something with it. Huh? Uh, the same thing for the LED. The LED, we uh, initialize it as a digital output. So it's an output GPIO. Uh, we have to give it the pin number where it's attached and some, some basic settings. 
And here it's just in a thread that it blinks. And uh, depending on the number of times you have uh, pressed the button, it starts blinking faster. Uh, and we use Maven, that's the default we use in, in the Py4j project. We use Maven to package our application. And in the distribution directory, we get all the modules which are used for this project. And we have a run script to help us to get uh, the application running and started. Now, uh, let's take a look at a small video I created. Um, it's no rocket science, it's just a, a sample application. So the let blinks as soon as the application starts and when the button is clicked is clicked it starts to blink a bit faster and after five times the application stops voila that's it so a very basic example um, but it gives you an idea how the application works and what you can create with it um, if you're interested, I also have a much more um, advanced example, which is fully described on my blog, where a queue is used. So for instance, yeah, if you never use the queue, it's, it's a system of uh, messaging. And so a client can subscribe to a, a post box. Someone can send messages to that post box and the client will receive it. If you go a bit further, then you can have multiple publishers, multiple subscribers, and they all exchange messages uh, through uh, a queue. Mosquito is one of those um, software applications which provide you with a queue, and it has um, a version which you can also install on the Raspberry Pi. So that's um, the, the wireframe of how I created the drum boot uh, of my son, for example. So you have a PC with a web browser. It can read the web page, which is provided by a Java web application running on the Raspberry Pi. This web application can uh, publish messages to a mosquito. It can also read it from there. You can have the same Java application running on another PC. And they all send messages to this mosquito. And we have an Arduino board listening to this mosquito for messages. And as soon as you select um, a blinking LED or something like that, or a color pattern that you want to be displayed um, on this LED strip, it's sent to the mosquito queue. Arduino receives it. And this one controls uh, the LED strip. Why do I control LED strips with an Arduino? Because that's something which is time critical. So it has to be to, to controlled with a precise timing. And an Arduino, a microcontroller, is uh, much better for this kind of use cases than you can do with the Raspberry Pi, which is a Linux operating system. So it can block if it has to do something else. You're never sure about the timing, which is exactly the same with even more, uh, much more expensive uh, PCs. Uh, if you install Mosquito on Raspberry Pi, you will have this very easy to use subscribe and publish um, helper applications so that you can test this Mosquito. Um, and I also created a small Java VIX application, which also sends messages to this queue and receives them just to show you how you can all uh, combine these. This is the kind of user interface I created, but it's Java VIX. That means that you can create everything you want yourself, uh, or you use the predefined buttons, or uh, with some CSS, uh, you can change a button and have exactly the look and feel you want uh, to have. Uh, on the Fuji blog, there are a lot of Java VIX articles describing how performant and how fine-grained you can define the CSS of uh, a control. Uh, like for instance, the corners of the buttons, how they, uh, how they look, you can go very much in detail. And even if you don't find exactly this, the layout you want to use, you have completely other methods that you can use in Java VIX uh, by painting on a canvas. But a lot of articles on Fuji are available for that. And of course, um, it's a Java application, so you can also include a web server. Undertow is only one of the many uh, options you have there, but Undertow is a very lightweight web server. You can integrate it in your Java application and run it on the Raspberry Pi, and then you have your web server uh, available on the Pi, and you can use it from anywhere in the house, or if you want to use it in the company, uh, you can really have it as a server and providing a lot of information. 
So this is then the end result. So you have the JavaFX application, which in this case is running on the PC, but it's exchanging messages with a, a Mosquito queue on a Raspberry Pi. You have this Arduino, which is Wi-Fi connected uh, to the same Mosquito. And by selecting here a different uh, speed or a color effect, uh, you see that it changes uh, on, on the LED strip. And there's also the web server here. And by selecting one of the color patterns here, the LEDs start to blink. So all this is controlled through a Raspberry Pi, just as one of the many examples of what you can do with it. Um, one last example um, is a game. Um, I won't show you the code. The code is on the Pi4j website, um, but you have this kind of arcade kits that you can buy. I think they are around 20 or 30 euros. So you get a lot of buttons. You get um, this joystick, which is actually four buttons. If you look on the bottom of it and some cables, you can have the optional hat, which um, makes it a bit easier to connect the cables because the everything is very well labeled. But you can also attach the connections of the cables directly to your Raspberry Pi is just, this is the dummy proof way of doing it. And then you can create any kind of game. I will show you one, which is created with uh, FXGL. And this was a post I have written for the Java magazine by Oracle. And I didn't really focus on uh, speed and performance. So this was just a very basic example uh, to show you what is possible. By the way, I'm also a very bad game player. So you see that I don't have a lot of score and I really need to make something to a fixture for my, for my joystick because I was a bit uh, struggling to play this game. <clears throat> but this is the kind of games you can create uh, with Java VIX with, oh, I think there are three or four classes in this file uh, with very minimal code. Okay, um, maybe before we jump to conclusions, let me show you one more thing. So what I have here is um, an additional camera. By the way, it's also, uh, uh, can I cannot show you directly. It's also Raspberry Pi inside some Lego, <laughs> but I want to show you this Crow Pi. So this is the thing I was mentioning before in the presentation. So it has a lot of components. Um, and on the Pi4j website, we have a whole project with the code of how you can control all the components um, on this Crow Pi. So we have here a Raspberry Pi 4. You, then you have this bridge which connects uh, everything with the suitcase itself with all the components. And then this uh, example application has a lot of different examples you can run. So this is the Java project. All the code is really separated in clean uh, example applications per device. So you have a button example, you have a light sensor example, all these. Um, and where different components are controlled, you also have this code and you have some helper functions. So this whole uh, demo application was created by some students of uh, the Swiss University FHNW uh, um, last year, and they contributed all this to uh, the Pi4j project. So I just started the application. Let's use um, the LED matrix application, which is number nine. And you see that we have then an animation running on the i8x8 eight eight LED matrix. Just as one of the demo applications, let quickly start another one. Ah, one which is not visual. Uh, the buzzer. Let's see if you hear this through my microphone. So this is a small buzzer and you can even create very fun music. <clears throat> so all this is part of the Pi4j uh, project. 
I kindly invite you to have a look at the website and see if there's anything you find here which is interesting for you or you can start creating uh, your own project. So what uh, did we learn? What did I want to show you is that Java and Java VIX on Raspberry Pi, they really work. They are a great way of building applications, user interface applications uh, on a very cheap piece of hardware. Um, if you combine it with electronics, you will learn a lot. Um, you will get frustrated, of course. I've burned a few LEDs and burned a few other components, but they are all very cheap um, and easy to replace. Um, with minimal code, you get big results. Uh, so you don't have to do a lot of coding. Java will help you a lot. Uh, like, for instance, running a web server, you can do that with a few lines of code. And um, what we didn't mention because we are experimenting with it is also GraalVM native compilation on the Raspberry Pi that it even runs faster, starts faster, uses less memory. We'll see when and, and how this comes to the Raspberry Pi. We have the new Pi 4J version 2. We have Java FX uh, further extending the possibilities and support for uh, embedded and, and Raspberry Pi. So there's still a lot of involvement uh, going on in, in that uh, matter. Um, if you want to learn more uh, about all this, I have my own blog. I do a lot of tweeting about all this, but definitely check out fuji.io. We have um, a Raspberry Pi section there, but there are uh, every day there's a new article and there's a lot you can find and learn there. Um, and of course, yeah, just build it and experiment it and have fun with it. Let's see if we have questions or if we switch to Geert Jan, who wants to share some info about Fuji itself. I don't see any questions yet. I actually have two. Um, first one. Um, so in your experience, how stable is this uh, experimental 64-bit version? Um, the, I didn't have uh, any issues with it. So I started mm -hmm. using it. Um, I've written an article about how I used it, uh, not with an SD card, but with the flash drive. So it even boots a lot faster. Uh, if you combine that. Um, I did experiment a bit with Ubuntu. Ubuntu has also a desktop 64-bit uh, version for the Raspberry Pi, but uh -huh. that was not successful. It was, I think it was already uh -huh. one or two years ago. Um, I had some stability issues there, but with the Raspberry Pi version itself, not. Um, and it's not really clear what, why the foundation, the Raspberry Pi foundation don't pushes it and they keep sticking to this 32-bit version. Now they have they have a clear view why, uh, of course, they want to have still the same operating system for all the boards. Also mm -hmm. the older boards that people who have bought a Raspberry Pi many years ago, they can still use the same uh, up-to-date recent version. Um, you have also uh, the, the, the small um, Raspberry Pis, they are on an ARM V6 processor, so there you have less capabilities of doing some newer stuff. Uh, but it also works with Java and Java VIX, by the way. So um, yeah, it's not really clear why they don't make the jump from the mm. foundation. Mm. Uh, but it seems to be stable and, and they have new versions from time to time. But they don't you know, announce we'll it. We'll see what the, what this chip shortage does to the industry because yeah. it's, um, it's going to force them in some direction. That's a big challenge. I just saw a tweet by uh, <clears throat> Jeff Gerling, who is doing a lot of, of YouTubing about the Raspberry Pi. And it seems so the Raspberry Pi 400, the, the, the keyboard uh, thing, mm -hmm. it has a slightly newer chip, which is a bit faster. And it seems that they are bringing that chip to the Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, it's, not, it's not that it's a big change, but it can run a bit faster. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you don't need to do a lot of overclocking if you want to uh, reach the same speed. Okay, my other question, I just wanted to double check. Um, I took a guess, but I imagine Mosquito is a MQTT implementation. Indeed. And it's, it's stock standard. So anything that talks MQTT should be, yep. should be fine. Okay, and that's good news. 
I don't know for the Raspberry Pi itself, but I was discussing uh, Mosquito with the people of HiveMQ, which is also an MQTT um, implementation. And you can really support a lot of devices and, and connections, mm -hmm. simultaneous connections with that, uh, with that system. Now, the moment you do that, it's so powerful because you, you disconnect it. So not everything has to be up at the same time. Yep, indeed. And yep. people don't realize how complicated it is to build something that knows when to reconnect and retry and all that stuff. But when you um, uh, uh, share a queue, then um, um, you can go crazy. And if you yep. if it's not persistent, then it's fast. Yeah, it's very fast. Um, it's, it's um, I mean, you're going to have to work hard to make your plain TCP uh, be significantly faster. Yeah. Uh, and and it's yeah. so much easier to use. And it's also a lot faster than, than databasing because <laughs> if you want to store data somewhere and you send it with a post command to an API, and it has to save it in the database, it takes a bit of time before it replies that it was done. A queue, you just dump it there yes. and it's immediately uh, received. So from that point of view, the performance is also a yeah, big difference, yeah. And if you, I mean, I imagine with the um, Java stuff and the iOS, because I remember I did some projects that spoke to hardware on Java and I basically offloaded all of that onto the background, so it never ran on the, on the front end th mm -hmm. thread. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, everything was nice and responsive. And um, That's also a bit like what, ja yeah, what JavaFX is doing. It should JavaFX, the visual stuff, is running in a separate thread. So yes. you have your own, yeah, you have the other things running in the background, so you can adapt your user interface to things happening in the background or data flowing in from a queue or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that library of um, uh, um, Garrett. Transfix, yeah. Nice. yeah. I definitely gonna have uh, a look yeah. there because it's the kind of thing I need for this other little project. In, in my background, so this, this site, this is also using uh, some tiles of X. Uh, oh, okay, it's yeah. like yeah. a scope. It uh, looks like a scope, but it's actually just a distance sensor and a button which is visualized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's also using tiles of X. Yeah, I miss that that world. I had a friend that we did a lot of projects together, but he died in a motorcycle accident four years mm -hmm. ago. And um, I haven't had uh, any any type of, of uh, uh, hardware-related work no. since then. Well, but, uh, I have a lot of a lot of getting started stuff for you waiting on Pi for J and no, I'm going to, and on Fuji. I've got a, my Raspberry <laughs> Pi is sitting there waiting for me. It's Every waiting to start, yes. It's waiting. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, yeah. Kirtian, do you have yes. something you Tell want to add? Tell us something about Fuji. Yes, thank you so much. So just uh, two quick minutes. Um, the background to this talk, um, this excellent, excellent talk by Frank, an inspiring talk by Frank, is um, Fuji, which is a site for friends of OpenJDK. And since we are interested in Java on the Raspberry Pi, we are by definition friends of OpenJDK. Um, on this site, you'll find um, every day a new article. And um, for example, in the area of Raspberry Pi, you'll find quite some content um, by Frank. Um, the, the nice thing is there's a search here and the search goes through the whole site and you can, uh, for example, in the, in the area of Raspberry Pi, you'll find a lot of blog posts, um, a lot of them by Frank. And he mentioned the Java 17 on the Raspberry Pi there's a whole article about this, about getting set up using SDK man, Visual Studio Code. So lots of information, but let's say we were interested in JavaFX, for example. So in this case, you'll find that there are blog posts, but there are also um, issues that have been fixed in Java itself. And um, on Fuji, you'll find all the fixes that have gone into each quarterly update. I don't think there's anywhere else where you can 
see those fixes for quarterly updates. Um, that's really what FUJ is about. And the fact that you can search through all those fixes for key terms. So you can see here in Java 17, uh, September. So that's, you know, that's the, that's the uh, recently released major update. Java 16. So in April, um, there was something that happened in relation to Java FX. I can go back to Java 14, Java 13. You can see quite some work was done here in Java 13 relating to Java FX. Uh, Java 11. So you can see per open JDK release and per quarterly update what actually happened with the the area of Java that you're interested in. Um, so it's really you should see it as a Wikipedia for Java developers. You come here, you search for whatever you find interesting, and then you find issues that have been fixed on blog posts and definitions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're going around um, to different jugs and talking about Java 17. And in Frank's case, it's all about Raspberry Pi. Another campaign we are running is um, the Works with Open JDK campaign. So again, as friends of Open JDK, we want to raise the um, visibility of Open JDK itself. So you can see here on um, the Okta site, for example, on GitHub, there is now a badge here that says Works with Open JDK. And Pi4j is actually the same. You see that here there is a nice badge on the GitHub site connecting it to the OpenJDK because the the sad thing about the OpenJDK is in a way is that it's very hidden. And if you look at a repository like this, you have no idea that it's being used. So I'll, I, it's comparable to a an engine in a car that you don't see the engine, but without the engine, you know what's the point of the car? So the idea would be that if you have any repository or if you have a LinkedIn profile, so if I go to LinkedIn and I go to my profile, you see a nice um, uh, banner here with works with OpenJDK in it. And there are some interesting variations. So for example, uh, Julian, who works at Agen, has combined the um, works with OpenJDK with the Adyen, um logo so in, in his banner. So, and, and another example is Heinz Kabutz, very well known um, South African Java expert. If you go to his banner, you see in the top right corner, it now says works with OpenJDK. So on your LinkedIn profile, on your GitHub, on your website, anywhere, you know, there are these um, Banner is available if you go to GitHub fuj slash fujio slash badges, and you will find that works with OpenJDK LinkedIn banner, which you can just stick right into your LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. and you can see all these badges in different sizes and so on, which you can stick into your GitHub repo or onto your website or whatever. It's about flying the OpenJDK flag. Um, yeah, and on Fuja, you find all kinds of information um, about the quarterly updates, what fixes have gone into there. Um, you also find out about which different OpenJDK distributions there are, because, of course, it's not just Oracle anymore. It's also Red Hat and Azul and Amazon, and each of them have their own OpenJDK distributions. So where would you go to find that information? Um, so on Fuji, you can see um, a whole list of the different um, distributions that are available. Um, what is a website nowadays without a Slack? So we have a Slack channel. You're very welcome to join in. And we have conversations about all kinds of Java-related topics. You'll find um, people from Gluon. You know, Jon Voss, you'll find active here from Datastacks, from Datadog, Marcus Hurt, the JFrog creator, um, Stephen Chin from JFrog, Frank um, from Toady, all kinds of people here. And um, this is also where we do our planning for the week. So it's Monday today. So here you can see a proposed schedule for the daily articles. So we, we do one or two per day. We don't want to over flood the community with content. We want to have one or two carefully curated articles. Um, and also, we have, of course, a Twitter. So please follow Fuji.io on Twitter. And every day, you'll get at least one tip or trick or insight relating to Java. 
Um, and what's coming up? Well, here is a nice surprise. Um, there is this API called the OpenJDK Discovery API, the Disco API, which is a meta layer on top of the Zulu API and the Tamarin API. And all these different OpenJDK distributions have their own APIs and GitHub repositories. And it provides one unified layer on top of all of them. And there are plugins for that into the different IDEs and editors. But there's also very soon going to be a download page on Fuji. And actually, there is already, except it's not been highlighted anywhere. So if you go right now to Fuji.io slash download, just don't don't promote it because it's not the final design. Um, the final design is, uh, is, is not multiple different tabs. It's going to be one tab. Now, here you can see that. So we select a particular OpenJDK distribution, uh, which is not so easy because which one would you choose, right? But at least it's honest. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the world we live in is a bit confusing right now. So you would start by making a choice about, you know, for example, Tamarin. And then um, you choose a particular version or you can do it the other way around. So we could choose 11. And if I choose 11, I can see which different um, distributions support 11. So that's all of them. But if I were to choose 17, you can see that quite a few of these are not, um, or maybe not 17, but let's say 18. Um, so several are now not uh, clickable. So you can choose either way. And seven uh, will also be. <laughs> yeah, seven will be. <laughs> seven will be kind of interesting as well. It's blue and, and <laughs> yeah. So you can see I, I can't select JetBrains here. It could even be clearer, um, but it's just Zulu, really. Um, yeah, actually, we should do something about this to make that clearer. Um, but anyway, so you can see that a, a general download page for all the distributions in one place, which is interesting because like if you're Red Hat, you're not interested in promoting Amazon, right? So on the Red Hat download page, you will not find Amazon's um, distribution. And on Oracle's OpenJDK download page, you will not find Red Hat's distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, where can you go? So Fuji is the vendor neutral place. You know, we want to support everybody. Um, and so you would make your selection. So it works both ways. Either you select a distribution or you select a JDK version, and then the distributions that are relevant to you are, are um, available. You can see this is slightly more grayed out than this one. So you can kind of see. Anyway, so this is coming up um, as well as a forum. And, you know, we're constantly adding new features uh, to the site. So that's so how can we find the, the Slack? Um, yeah. Community? So um, if you're on the Fuji homepage, you will see here Community Hub, and here you see Slack channel. Okay, so that's uh -huh. one way. Another way is I can put right now into our chat the invitation to the Slack channel. Oh, uh, that would be great. Uh, so I'm copy the invite link uh, and let me stop sharing and then I'll just pop this into the chat here and just click on that link and you'll be able to join the uh, Slack. Oh, this chat. Okay. I'm yep. going to share it with our um, Please do. audience. And what you'll find is as well, it's very easy to publish content um, on Fuji. Frank, tell us about that. Yes, so it's a WordPress site. That means that anyone can who can type in a Word document <laughs> yeah, exactly. can actually block. Um, what I did in, in the beginning was I had a lot of content already on my blog. So that's what I reshared then on Fuji. And now... A lot happens vice versa. I first write on Fuji and then I share it again on, um, on my own blog. But that's a bit the idea. Anyone who is busy with Java, who is interested in the language, who has some good ideas, what you can do with it, how you can work with it, book reviews. So it's all part of, of Fuji. So um, if you're 
creating some kind of open source project and you have a new version, then the release notes can also be published on FUJ. Uh, what we have done with Py4j, for instance. Um, so anything which can help other Java developers or Kotlin or the Java, yeah, how you call it? The Java scene, the Java whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anything which it touches Java um, should be part of FUJ. Yeah, what you often find in um, on, on blog sites and etc., like Deezer and whatever, is lots of advertising. Now, FUJ has no advertising. And you just join the Slack and you say, hello, um, I'm Philip. I have content that I'd like to promote or share or tips or whatever. And then we give you a user and password. You can log into the WordPress. You put your content into the queue. Monday morning, we do our planning for the week. And then I'm the one that goes, checks through it and tweaks things as needed. You know, you can put really rough stuff in there that's not complete and not perfect and code doesn't, you know, whatever. Um, I'll tweak it and, and tidy it up and then I publish it according to our schedule. That's right. It's really lightweight, really lightweight. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have too much friction in this world in any case. <laughs> uh, well, the problem is that, that the Java documentation was a bit scattered and if you looking and that was one of the the main thing reasons for for fuji to start is um you, you end up at some old oracle sites for instance where some older versions of java are described while if you go to another programming language uh, like python or whatever um, the initial site you end up is is from the creator and you have some example code and and that's actually the thing that that fuji now tries to do for, for Java. Um, there was a new dev.java or something which was announced by Oracle. Yep. I mean, uh... Like if you go to dev.java, you yeah, go to yeah, the download, indeed. if you go to the download page, you can only download Oracle's yeah, like in JDK. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an Oracle site so that we have mm -hmm. to use. I think the thing which is clear is they use the Java logo, um, so which is trademarked. So then yeah. you know, yeah, I'm on Oracle site. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, while Fuji wants to combine everything, all the knowledge which is available, all the versions which are available. Um, and that's yeah. a great thing about the site. Exactly. That's great. I mean, it's a site that we should always have had, you know, it's a site we yes. did have with, with Java.net. We had that site once upon a time, um, if you remember back in Sun Microsystems days, then we had Java.net. Um, but this is as close to that as it can possibly be. Um, no, I think you're doing a great job because it's a, um, a source of truth. Because one, I think one of the challenges for developers in general is you land on a you do a search and you land on something yeah. and rarely do you know um, how relevant this is to the version that you're using. Yeah. So um, that's one of the things that, for example, I've, I've, I've suggested to the um, Spring communities that they, um, they need to do two things. The one is they need to um, tell you that you're looking at uh, 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 maybe some Java doc page, but now you don't know which spring module has this, this thing in it because it's, um, it's not in spring core, it's maybe somewhere else. And you don't know which packages go into which modules. So they need to have something that tells you that. And then the other thing they need is they need uh, um, like some of the languages like uh, I think the um, Scala site or the Scala Play site does that, where you've got a drop down that switches between the versions, so you can easily switch between versions of the mm -hmm. of the code. So you need something like that, where you have at least because mo most people are using Spring Boot, for example. So you want to switch between 2.5, 2.4, 2.3, and at least know which one you're looking at um, and the related stuff. And um, um, maybe that's something that um, I don't know if you're allowed to host a Java doc 
Yeah, that's the next. That's one of the next things. That's one okay. of the next things I want to do. That's Except yes, that because because that that could, that that'll become a a, a um, you can you can you can do something more than just plonk down Java doc. Yeah, but but the uh, thing, but that, but the, the main reason why we haven't yet is because we we wanted to do things that hadn't already been done. And mm, if you look for mm. Java doc, you can already find Java doc. But you know, so this is why we started with those fixes, those quarterly updates. Like nowhere do you find what is actually in those quarterly updates, except if you're on some special mailing list. So we started with that, and then we did the list of open JDK distributions, and then. We thought, okay, we need to have a reason for people to come back every day. So we need a blog. And then we added a calendar. So now there's a, a community calendar there. But there's going to come a point where, where, where Javadoc will be the logical next step for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, this community, I mean, we're going on to um, what are we now, 26 years. Yeah. And. Um, it feels as fresh as ever. <laughs> In fact, now we're hanging on. Uh, uh, it, it, it's actually a challenge to keep up. So um, well, it's not that you have to keep up to date the whole time. Eh? Because today, um, Spring Six was announced, and then they will come with Spring Boot Three, I guess, and all will yeah. be based on Java Seventeen. But mm -hmm. by the time they will release that, we will already be on Java 19. So yes. uh, in one year. So mm -hmm. we have these evolutions. And it, it's not that you need to switch from 11 to 17. But if you do so, you take all these changes which were introduced in every new version. There was something which was very powerful and helping you to be a better coder. You have the switch expressions which are improved. Then you have the string blocks. If you do some, for, for instance, I use the string blocks a lot where I have JSON unit tests, parsing mm, unit mm. JSON to data and back. You have this nice JSON you can just plug, paste in your code between string blocks, and it's it. You don't have all these extra uh, backslash um, uh, quote double quotes, so you have much cleaner codes. Um, so it's not that you switch for for better performance, you just get that as an advantage on top of it. But you can be a better coder and a cleaner coder if you keep evolving with this with this language. Yeah. I think, um, unfortunately, there's a part of the community that's uh, that's trapped in an environment where they uh, they're not allowed to touch old code um, because they must always be doing something new. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that um, um, a lot of systems, the code seems to be something that it's like a living organism that just wants to die. Um, and you have to <laughs> nurse it every now and then to, to keep it alive. And um, uh, um, you might uh, discover something new. I find that invariably you go back to old code and you realize there's a huge simplification uh, you can make um, uh, because something was maybe clumsy or difficult to read. And by doing it, you improve it. Obviously, uh, doing that without having um, uh, unit tests around it is a um, dangerous exercise. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I think that, the, and, and what's going to happen is you're going to have this, this grow, gap growing between the people who are stuck on old stuff and they, they, they're complaining about Java when in fact, uh, no, you're complaining about Java 5, which is yeah, running indeed. on Java 8, mm -hmm. um, or, or Java 1.4, which is running on Java 8, and um, you're not allowed to change it um, because your boss wants you to work on something else. And um, I think there's lots of people stuck in that um, in that situation, and it's it's unfortunate. So I think that's part of the education we need to 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 bring out there is that um, uh, uh, you don't just write the code and, and forget about it. Mm -hmm. I've got code that yeah. I've written over 20 years ago that's still in production. 
and I don't know if anybody's touched it, but um, uh, um, but the beautiful thing is it still runs. And yes, <laughs> and if, I've written a post for Fuji about Java VX 3D, which I was not aware of that it even existed. And mm. if you start looking, it's the examples are some of them are pretty old. Yes, but yes. I have some running on the Raspberry Pi with with Java 17 now. So mm. they just run. It's Java. They, they, it's not the hell which happened between Python 2 and 3 that, that your code was really broken. It, it's Java, it's stable, it just keeps improving. Uh, and that's, well, I think uh, the only thing people need to realize is that, um, yes, there's something that, that's been moved out. So, for example, if you've, I've got uh, a system that's now 16 years old, no, 14 years old that um, was done with uh, web services and Jaxby and things like that. So um, moving off Java 8, which I'm now fighting to get out, out of WebSphere um, to, to Spring Boot. And that, that then means I'll need to add Jaxby to, to my build. So I just need to find that dependency and change it from mm -hmm. compile to <laughs> To implementation and um, and uh, uh, and off we go. But these are the things that uh, that you find when you search, and then you come across um, Fuji or um, blogs, um, not necessarily um, um, uh, uh, Java specific information. It might be hidden somewhere in a in a in a, in a release or something like that, but. Um, that's where people need some guidance. I'm actually working on a on a on a, on a presentation for next month for Josie Jack just to highlight the um, the changes since eight. Um, I'll lot. see if it's eight or eleven, but all of them. But just the the, uh, the highlights, the, yep. the big ones, the interesting things, um, and then obviously links to to resources so that um, people can plan. And then something that I, I like to do is um, I'm always interested in what's, what, am, I, am I actually gaining something? And with, with 17, there's definitely some performance gains. So I've got some old uh, talks where I did stuff where I benchmarked stuff. So now I can uh, compare those same things against uh, 8 and 11 and um, uh, and, and 17 and, and show the differences and people can see well there's actually a step forward um, because 17 definitely has uh, a performance bump yeah it's not insignificant so it is interesting um I just want to check if there are any questions. That's one of the things with Slack is I've now got so many groups. <laughs> oh, workspaces. That's the term. Okay, we've we've got now questions from the audience. I'm um, I'm hoping that they, um, they all questions. The, been, all questions have been answered. Yes. That was a they, great presentation. Or they will Frank. come later if people start experimenting. <laughs> well, if people want to ask questions afterwards, join uh, Frank on the Fuji Slack and yes. you know, discuss um, Raspberry Pi there. Mm -hmm. With pleasure. So, just for everybody, if you um, haven't um, joined the Slack channel, if you, um, I'm going to share uh, a link to our um, feedback form. Um, so if you've got feedback for, uh, for, for Frank, uh, you can provide it there. But um, what uh, the idea is that if you want to um, join the um, uh, list for people that's in the next draw for the JetBrains license, um, please um, uh, fill in the form, and at the bottom there's a space for you to add your name and address and um, 
for email and Twitter handle and stuff, and then you'll be part of the of the draw. So um, tomorrow morning, I'm going to make this channel private. So everybody who's, um, who's part of the channel and who completed the form, uh, they can be part of the next draw. So um, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for entertaining us, Frank. Um, my, um, oh, Dav says the form isn't accepting feedback. Okay. I am, Dav, I am going to um, try and figure out why. I thought when I saw it the first time, it was just me. Um, uh, I need to figure out why it doesn't, because I made a copy of a form and maybe it's done something um, uh, silly. So I will, I will fix this and post the uh, upload. Just type the message here. Okay. Um, thank you for entertaining us, Frank. My um, appetite is um, uh, activated. I definitely want to um, fire up this um, raspberry Pi standing behind me. Definitely do. And um, I'm interested to see what you do next. Uh, once again, nice to see you, Fiatan. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Keeping us up to date on Fujai and um, all the work you're doing on, on the community. It's wonderful. Um, thanks, Philip, for joining us. And um, to our faithful uh, uh, juggers, I don't know when we're going to meet in person. It's probably going to be sometime March or April, um, maybe earlier. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. Um, but um, we want to do it when it's safe for everybody. And I'm pretty sure when we start, we'll still want to um, uh, see that people at least are, are, are vaccinated uh, before they join us. That's probably the safest way to go. Um, I would like to believe that our members are rational, sound um, uh, people uh, who've taken those steps. If you haven't, if you have doubts, uh, Contact me privately. Um, I'll, I'll gladly talk to you. Um, or I'll meet you somewhere and punch you until you do. No, I'm just joking. Um, I don't think anybody needs to be uh, uh, um, persuaded in a strong arm way. Um, uh, a rational mind should be able to consider their options. So um, everybody be safe. Look after yourself. And um, thanks for joining us. Good, good evening. night, everybody. Yeah, good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.